Next, we'll talk about the treatment of irritability and autism spectrum disorder, specifically atypical antipsychotic medications. We'll start with talking about a case. Ms. D is a 17-year-old minimally verbal woman with autism spectrum disorder and a profound insistence on sameness, ritual, and routine. The caregivers had a plan to care for D in the family home into her adult years, but they are bringing her to you for treatment because there have been escalating problems with aggression and self-injury that have made the parents not confident they can care for D into adulthood. With small limits or changes in her routine, D is increasingly engaging in more forceful headbanging, aggressive strikes and pinching towards caregivers. Dad's declining health has resulted in him not being as available to provide daytime structure outside of school, and D has more open-ended time, which seems to have perhaps worsened some of these behavioral concerns. The treatment of irritability is a very common reason for patients with autism spectrum disorder to be brought to the prescribing clinician in both higher-functioning patients with autism as well as patients with autism with co-occurring substantial intellectual disability. We might understand the construct of irritability as being around problems with emotional regulation, frustration tolerance, a quick progression to unsafe behaviors such as aggression, self-injury, throwing items, property destruction, elopement, in response to non-preferred demands such that families are walking on eggshells. The first trial I want to talk with you about is Risperdone for the treatment of irritability. This was a trial that was done by the Rupp Group a group of academic institutions that pool their resources to study the treatment of medication-based interventions for behavioral concerns, in this case, in patients with autism. This was a trial that was 82 boys, 19 girls, mean age of 8 years old. Subjects had to have significant irritability, as measured using the aberrant behavioral checklist irritability subscale when they entered into the trial. It was an eight-week trial. It was double-blind, placebo-controlled parallel groups. The clinicians were allowed to use flexible dosing in the range of risperidone, half a milligram to three and a half milligrams per day. A responder was judged as someone who had a 25% reduction in the aberrant behavioral checklist irritability subscore. You had to have a 25% reduction and then also be rated as very much improved or much improved on a measure called the Clinical Global Impression Improvement Scale, the CGII. Much improved or very much improved is a responder. That plus the reduction in the ABCI score. So it was a high standard in terms of whether or not someone was a responder or not. This figure I want to show you here has to do with showing the percent of subjects that responded taking risperidone versus placebo. You'll see 34 out of the 49 subjects taking risperidone were responders as compared to only six taking placebo. So certainly a positive trial attesting to the benefit of risperidone. If we dig a little bit more into the results, there was a reduction in stereotypy and also hyperactivity. So while I wouldn't think about risperidone as necessarily being a treatment for ADHD, in this case, these were subjects that were very aggressive, there may be a reduction in hyperactive symptoms with the usage of risperidone, and this is not unusual to see this area improve. Averse events that were seen in this trial, the most important to talk about is weight gain a weight gain of 2.7 kilograms in just this short eight-week trial. And that was compared to a weight gain of 0.8 kilograms among the placebo population. In addition to increased appetite, fatigue, drowsiness, dizziness, and drooling were all more common in the risperidone group. There were not differences in extrapyramidal symptoms, things like focal dystonias, Parkinsonism, or akathisia. But again, this was just an eight-week trial. One important thing to talk about with the usage of risperidone is the potential risk for hyperprolactinemia. The usage of antipsychotics with relatively high D2 affinity, such as risperidone or haloperidol, for instance, warrant monitoring for symptoms of hyperprolactinemia. Symptoms of hyperprolactinemia that are important for the clinician to watch for include suppressed or abnormal menstruation, gynecomastia, galactorrhea, bone demineralization, or decreased libido. Monitoring prolactin levels can prompt the clinicians to remember to ask about these symptoms. When elevated prolactin levels are combined with symptoms of hyperprolactinemia, the clinical symptoms I talked about, clinicians should consider decreasing the dosage, changing agents away from risperidone entirely, or, in severe cases, adding a dopamine agonist, such as a low dosage of aripiprazole, which can actually 
decrease prolactin levels and may reverse the side effect of concern. Another important side effect to talk about with risperidone in greater detail is metabolic syndrome and weight gain. There was a trial that looked at metformin for the treatment of weight gain in individuals with autism who had to take risperidone or aripiprazole for the treatment of irritability. This was a 16-week trial, double-blind, placebo-controlled, 60 subjects with ages 6 to 17 years. These were all subjects that had weight gain from atypical antipsychotics used to treat irritability. These subjects had to be stable for one month with the dosage of the antipsychotic medication and had about a 7% increase in BMI. So that was sort of the trigger for them moving forward with this trial of metformin. The dosing was 500 milligrams twice a day given in meals to six and nine-year-olds who participated and 850 milligrams twice a day for subjects 10 to 17 years of age. The primary outcomes were whether metformin was tolerable and safe and whether or not there was a decrease in the rate of increase of BMI as measured using a Z-score. The results of this trial indeed showed that metformin was helpful for reducing the rate of weight gain induced by medications like risperidone and other atypical antipsychotic medications for irritability and autism. The mean weight gain from metformin over the duration of the three-month trial was less as compared to placebo. And 11% of subjects taking metformin actually had a BMI decrease of 8 to 9%. Of note, the differences in terms of the rate of weight increase was not apparent until after eight weeks. So it's important not to give up on metformin too soon. Giving it a trial of two to three months is necessary in order to determine whether or not there's real benefit. Metformin was tolerable in this patient population. The major difference was the frequency of days of GI complaint. GI complaints included things like abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, bloating, or flatulence. There was one subject in the metformin group that had significant agitation and had to leave the trial for that reason. In finishing up this section, I'll briefly mention a trial that was done in aripiprazole in autism. This was a drug company-funded trial of 98 subjects in children and adolescents with autism ages 6 to 17 years old with substantial irritability. It was an eight-week double-blind placebo-controlled trial with the dosing range between 2 and 15 milligrams per day. Subjects ended up on a mean dosage of aripiprazole of 8.5 milligrams per day, and they had greater reductions in the ABC irritability subscale as compared to placebo, and that was a significant difference. So it was also a positive trial attesting to the improvements in irritability with aripiprazole. The most common adverse events were fatigue, somnolence. Weight gain was also seen in aripiprazole, 2.1 kilograms over an eight-week trial as compared to one kilogram of placebo in terms of mean differences. So the clinical approach for the treatment of irritability in patients with autism spectrum disorder, clinicians should know there's the best evidence for risperidone and aripiprazole, which both carry an FDA indication for the treatment of irritability. Key points to draw from this section include Risperidone and aripiprazole carry an FDA indication for the treatment of irritability in children and adolescents with autism. Metabolic side effects, including weight gain, are common when prescribing antipsychotics for irritability and autism. Weight gain with antipsychotics in patients with autism can be attenuated by adding metformin for patients that gain substantial weight in the first few weeks of treatment.